I don't know how you preach after that. Goodness, man, I'm like ugly crying, snot everywhere. It's just like, isn't it good to have Adam back in the house? It's so good, so good. I feel like we've already had church, like we can just go home, but uh, I do think God has, has another word for us today. So if you have your Bibles, your Bible app, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 17, and uh, we'll dive right in. When I was growing up, uh, we vacationed, our family vacationed at Smith Mountain Lake, Virginia. Anybody ever been to Smith Mountain Lake? You remember the movie, What About Bob? That was, that was filmed there. Um, I'm old school, but... Uh, We grew up going to Smith Mountain Lake, uh, and we stayed at Mr. Harrison's cabin. Mr. Harrison was a kind-hearted, generous man from our church who would let us uh, use his cabin. And he had a a sailboat that was always anchored about 20 yards offshore. Every summer, it would be there, just just floating. And uh, we did, my family and I did a lot of skiing and, you know, uh, wakeboarding and that kind of stuff, but never any, any sailing. And even to this day, my only experience with sailing is that sailboat that was, that was anchored 20 yards off the shore, the one that my brothers and I would often swim out to and climb aboard, uh, even though we were not allowed to, but we did. Um, the, that sailboat that was, that was uh, weathered, that windows boarded up, sails tucked away, That sailboat that maybe at one point in its life sailed, but my experience with that sailboat was not that. It it had seen much better days, weathered and old and not equipped to sail anywhere, not equipped to do what it was designed and created and built to do. Well, when we think about the way God has designed us and equipped us and built us as followers of Jesus, to live out our calling and our potential in the world. Perhaps at the top of the list is a life of declaring the goodness of God, a life of proclaiming the name of Jesus. That's Mark number six here at Seven Marks. And that's why we're in the middle of the series that's trying to equip us to be better proclaimers of the name of Jesus. I mean, that was literally Jesus' final instructions to his disciples, and subsequently us as followers of Jesus. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, he said this, this is his final marching orders. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea and Samaria, and into the end of the earth. He's called us to be his witnesses. What is a, a witness? Well. Very simply, it's someone who testifies to the facts, right? And so as witnesses for Jesus, we're testifying to who he is and what he's done. And what I wanna propose to you today is that one of the ways that you and I bear witness for Jesus is much the same way a sailboat is designed, to open its sails and catch the wind current of the Spirit of God And God wants us to be people who open our sails, the the sails of our obedient life, and allow his spirit to blow into it and lead us along the path that he's forging and the trail that he's blazing in the the wind stream of his current. In John chapter three, Jesus describes the spirit of God moving like a wind as he regenerates hearts with spiritual new birth. Maybe you remember this. He's talking to Nicodemus and Jesus says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes and so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. See, the Spirit of God is always actively blowing and moving and breathing new life into people all the time. It's entirely the work of God, make no mistake. But he invites you and I to be a part of that work, and that is an unbelievable truth, that he invites us into it. No, we don't, we don't save anyone, we don't convert anyone, but God invites us into that process. Remember how the Apostle Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. He said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. 
How amazing is that? Like God brings the growth, Jesus does the saving, but he invites you and I into that process. It's unbelievable that he would invite us into it. Now, go back to our original metaphor just for a moment, the metaphor of the sailboat. Doesn't it make sense that you and I would want to extend our sails and catch the wind current of the Spirit of God? It makes sense, but the the problem is we often live like the sailboat from my childhood, don't we? Like windows have been boarded up, sails tucked away, we've been decommissioned, we've seen better days, anchored in place, decommissioned. The wind isn't taking us anywhere because we're not extending our sails to catch the wind of the Spirit of God and respond accordingly. That's mark number three here at Seven Marks. We haven't aligned our sails to the Spirit of God, and so we sit, float, anchored 20 yards off the shoreline with all the potential in the world, but doing nothing. And please hear me, I, I, want, you, I want you to know my heart. Like I'm coming to you as someone with anguish in his, his heart who wants to live this way, but I'm not there yet, if I'm honest. And so I say we. You and I, we end up missing out on so much of what the Lord is calling us to, the bigger story that he is writing when we insulate and we isolate ourselves away from the mission of God, when we tuck our sails away and we refuse to catch the wind current of God as he seeks to reconcile the world. He's seeking that none should perish but that all come to repentance. That's God's heart and he invites you and I into that process. It's his work but he invites us into it. Henry Blackaby says this in Experiencing God. We don't choose what we will do for God. He invites us to join him where he wants to involve us. How many of you have ever been guilty of saying, God, here's my plan. Will you you get on my page? And God's saying, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. I write the plan, I write the playbook. You get involved in what I'm doing. Right. So when you and I get a sense of what the Spirit of God is doing, that he's moving and that he's blowing, that's his invitation to you and to me into his work. But maybe you say, Josh, like how, how will I know when the wind current of the Spirit of God is moving and inviting me? Well, that's a great question. And so we're going to look at Acts chapter 17, the example of Paul when he's in the city of Athens, and I believe we're gonna see some principles that will help us determine how do we know when God's spirit is moving and inviting us into what he's doing. And so as you're turning there, I wanna give you just a little bit of background. Paul's in the city of Athens, um, Socrates' city. It's one of the most pagan cities in the ancient world. Uh, Some historians say there were just as many idols in the city of Athens as there are churches in many of the southeastern uh, cities of the United States. That's, that's a lot of island. Especially if you've ever been to like Greenville, South Carolina, church on every corner. I went to college down there, church on every corner. That's how the city of Athens was in terms of idolatry. So Paul finds himself in a very pagan city where he's sharing Jesus with Jews, with elites, and then eventually he's invited into a place called the Areopagus. The Areopagus was a place where Uh, philosophers would gather and they would share and discuss new ideas where they would have debate and dialogue. And Pastor Paul, to no end, has sent me pictures and texts this week and he said, hey, by the way, Josh, you know I've been to the Areopagus. Like it's one of those things like, hey, I walked on the moon, just kind of mic drop, and I've been so frustrated this week. Yeah, you've been to the the Areopagus. I, I get it, Pastor Paul. But on this day, on this day, When Paul is at the Areopagus, there are at least two audiences, the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans were like the the pleasure seekers. Their motto would have been something like, eat, drink, and be merry, tomorrow you die, right? Pleasure seekers. And then there are the Stoics. The Stoics were extremely religious and spiritual. They made idols out of literally everything. And make no mistake, our culture isn't too far behind, is it? Our idols just look a little bit different. Our idols are fame and sexuality, and power and money. 
So our culture is not too far behind. And as we look at Paul's example of someone who followed the wind of the Spirit, I believe we're gonna see two clarifying questions today to help us as we also seek to follow the wind of the Spirit. And I'm indebted to author Jamie Winship for, for providing language for this. And here they are, two clarifying questions. Number one, God, what are you saying and doing? God, what are you saying and doing? And number two, what do you want me to do about it? What do you want me to do about it? So let's look at that first question together. God, what are you saying and doing? This is what we might call spiritual attentiveness. Spiritual attentiveness is paying careful attention to the voice and the activity of God. Notice Paul's attentiveness, if you look in verse 16 there in Acts chapter 17. It says, now while Paul was waiting for them, waiting for who? These were his traveling companions. These were his friends, his missionary buddies. He was waiting for them in Athens. His spirit was provoked within him. If you, if you have a hard copy, you should underline that word, provoked. Within him, as he saw that the city was full of idols. And then jump down to verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive, underline that word, perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed, underline that word, the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, and what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So here's what's happening. Paul's in the city of Athens, he's waiting for his friends, but he was spiritually attuned to what was happening around him. Scripture said he, he was provoked within him, that he was perceiving things and he was observing things. He didn't waste his time while he waited on his friends to get there. He had his spiritual antenna up, his spiritual receptors, recognizing the voice and the activ activity of God all around him. See, how many understand this? When you leave your house every day, like you're entering your mission field. You get that right. When you walk out that door, you are entering your mission field. And so you and I have to always be asking the question, God, what are you saying and what are you doing in this moment? What are you saying and what are you doing? When I walk into my office on a Monday morning, God, what are you saying and what are you doing? When I'm with other parents on the soccer field or at the dance and I'm observing, we're observing our kids, God, what are you saying and what are you doing? When I have an unexpected layover in an unfamiliar city, God, what are you saying and what are you doing? And that's why Paul was able to leverage this opportunity because he had his spiritual antenna up. He was spiritually alert and ready for it. And God's word tells us that he was provoked in his spirit in verse 16. The word provoked is really interesting. It, it denotes like this kind of severe emotional concern to be greatly distressed, stirred, vexed, grieved, emotional concern. It's the kind of concern that might compel someone to jump out in front of a moving train to save a life. So when Paul looked around the city of Athens and he saw all these idols, man, his spirit was provoked. There was this kind of heartbreak that he felt for the people of the city. When was the last time your heart broke for our city, for your neighbors? When was the last time you were just provoked within you when you thought about the eternal destiny of people who don't know Jesus? But see, it starts with compassion. It starts with love, doesn't it? And I don't wanna re-preach Pastor Paul's message last week. If you didn't hear it, you need to go listen. But here's one of the things he said. In today's world, bringing people to Jesus will be about loving people to Jesus, remember him saying that. 100% yes, like when we are truly filled with love and compassion for people, our words then carry the ability to offer hope and healing. But it starts with love, it starts with compassion. And people can smell, listen, people can smell a religious salesman a mile away and there's nothing compelling about that. Nothing compelling about it. Remember how Matthew describes Jesus at one point in his ministry. Matthew 9, 36. 
he says, when he saw the crowds, he had, what's that word? Compassion for them. Compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus felt compassion for people. They weren't nameless faces like on a spiritual scorecard that he was keeping. No, they were people made in God's image that he loved and cared for and was about to die for. The same is true for your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, your relatives. Would you say you genuinely love people that way? If we're gonna be for our city, we have to be people of compassion, of love. As we observe and we perceive the needs of our city and our world, our hearts have to break for what's happening. And so with his spiritual antenna raised, he, Paul looks around with spiritual attentiveness and he asks, God, what are you saying and what are you doing in this city, in this moment? But not only that, he was asking, God, what do you want me to do about it? How quickly are we to say, God, what do you want her to do about it? What do you want him to do about it? And God's saying, no, let's look at your own heart first. God, what do you want me to do about it? Simple responsiveness is what we might call this. Simple responsiveness. That's stepping into the current of God's voice and activity. As he's breathing new life into people, he wants us to extend our sails and step into that. Look at verse 17. It says that, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection, and they brought him, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. So notice Paul's simple responsiveness and the progression. Right, He starts with Jews, like his own people, in the synagogues, and then he moves to the marketplace, again, opening the sails of his obedient life. And then eventually he's invited into the Areopagus, all the while Paul opening his sails, opening his mouth to proclaim Jesus to this pagan city. From Jews to devout people to commoners to elites, each opportunity was the act of keeping in step with the Spirit, as Paul had early encouraged the church of Galatia. You remember in Galatians chapter five? He says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. This was Paul simply saying yes to each and every opportunity that the wind of the Spirit brought his way. Simple responsiveness. God, what are you saying? What are you doing? And what do you want me to do about it? And as he asked that question, God, what do you want me to do about it? God brought him to a place where he had a captive audience. And he opened his mouth and he proclaimed Jesus. He stepped out into obedience. What's the content of his message? And this is so important. If you look down in verse 18, it says that others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus and the resurrection was his content. Jesus and the resurrection. Why? Because everything about the Christian message hinges on that. You realize that. And everything that you and I build our lives on as followers of Jesus hinges on the resurrection. Why? A dead Jesus can't save anybody. You realize that? A dead Jesus can't do anything to help our spiritual condition. But a risen Savior, now that's a whole new ball game. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised... Our preaching is, what's that word? Useless. And so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Verse 20, but, this is a big but of scripture, okay? I'm, in fact, I'm gonna tell the elders, we need to do a series called Big Butts. <laughs> big Butts of scripture, and this is like one of the biggest ones. 
but Christ has indeed been raised. Somebody shout hallelujah. He's been raised. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That is the message that has changed us and the message that you and I get to share with the lost world. How has the risen, resurrected Savior changed you? Like, that's what the world wants to know. You don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't have to be a historian. You don't have to be an expert in theology. All you need to know is, how has the risen, living, resurrected Savior changed me? And then you share that. You remember John chapter 9, when the blind man was healed by Jesus. He didn't even know who Jesus was. Jesus just came along and healed him. And then the religious leaders were like, what just happened? And he said, I don't actually know, but all I know is I was blind and now I see. Look, you just share what you know. How has the living Jesus changed you? You don't have to be an expert, but you know that. You have a story, a story that the world needs to hear. How has the risen, resurrected Savior changed you? And so how does this look on a Monday, on a Tuesday, when you and I are struggling to be obedient? We start with spiritual attentiveness. God, what are you saying? What are you doing? And then we commit to say yes, simple responsiveness. God, what do you want me to do about it? Now, here's how I wanna end our time I want, to, I want us to talk to someone, a couple, who is actively living this out, actively attentive to the Spirit of God and responsive to the Spirit of God, who's always asking that question, God, what are you saying and doing, and what do you want me to do about it? So I want to invite Adam and Caitlin Neal to come on out. Hopefully they're back there somewhere. Adam was leading worship. Adam is no stranger, Adam and Caitlin are no strangers to our church family. Uh, he was on staff here for seven or eight years, and um, within the past three years or so, they launched out in faith to start a nonprofit called Refuge Retreat. It is a ministry entirely devoted to making disciple-making disciples out of college students, which is just amazing. And I can tell you, they're not just um, talking about it, they're living it. My family and I, three weeks ago, we loaded up our van and our one million kids, and we <laughs> drove to Myrtle Beach, and we joined them for one of their retreats. I mean, I'm telling you, they are living example of this. God, what are you saying, what are you doing, and what do you want me to do about it? So I wanted you to hear a little bit from Adam and Caitlin uh, as they just kind of take us a little bit, give us a snapshot of their journey. So I want to start with Caitlin. Caitlin, um, it's good to see you. Tell us a little bit, like, what does life look like right now out there in Flat Rock, North Carolina? Well, we have been married for 10 years. We've got three girls. They're ages six, four, and two. And if you ask Adam how many kids he wants, he would tell you two. So <laughs> we're kind of over our max here. But they obviously keep us very busy. Um, we've been in ministry for, uh, since the beginning of our marriage. So we're very familiar with that pace of life. Um, but we started Refuge Retreat three years ago, and um, so we live in Hendersonville, North Carolina, right outside of Asheville. Um, we love just to, you know, do the typical things you do in western North Carolina, get outdoors, go for hikes, play in the rivers. Um, we're mountain people now, you know. Um, so yeah, that's, that's life for us these days. Adam leads Refuge full-time, um, which is a really big blessing. I kind of balance my call to motherhood and ministry, and um, that's, that's what life looks like. Awesome, awesome. So Adam, take us back a little bit prior to launching Refuge Retreat. Like, what was God doing? What was he stirring in your heart um, when you started to ask God, what are you doing and saying? What do you want me to do about it? Take us through that process. Yeah, I've, we have always said that we don't feel like God calls just one of us, and then I pull her along with me. It's together on it, and so we just both felt like God was, it was an unsettling. You know, I don't know if anyone has struggled with like restless leg syndrome, but it was like that, but in our hearts. Like it just felt like an uncomfortable, God's doing something, he's speaking to me, he's speaking to her, and it was just this uncomfortable, like we gotta figure out what this is. And I think, if anything, it, it put a deeper desire in both of us to draw close to him. Mm -hmm. Of, it, you know, if we really want to know what it is that he's saying, we gotta draw close to him and hear his voice. And so we just, 
we committed to every morning, and again, with young kids, it's, you know, it's not always quiet in the household, but we committed to every morning, we wanted to wake up, read our Bible out loud together, pray out loud together. We had done that individually in our own quiet moment, but together as a couple, praying and reading out loud, um, and just, I mean, just trying to be quiet and listen as much as we could to hear what God is saying, and I mean, it was a six-month process of, wow. of seeking, and you know, you, you tend to pray for all the answers, mm -hmm. and then about halfway through, you go, why, that's, if, if I have all the answers, yeah. is it even a step of faith? You know what I mean? Like, we just need to pray for boldness to, like, do what, when we have enough clarity, we're going to say yes, but that doesn't mean you're going to have all the answers. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, after six months, we knew college students that make disciples, that was not negotiable. It was making disciples of, you know, whoever it may be, but college students was what God told both of us, and wow. then we knew the vehicle to do that was gonna be through retreats, and wow. there were still a ton of unknowns. There still are a lot of unknowns, yeah. but um, we were ready to say yes and just kind of went in. So. Awesome, awesome. So, Caitlin, we kind of know the result is Refuge Retreat, um, and you guys, as you looked at God, what are you doing? What are you expecting of me? Um, take, us, take us through that process. How was it when you began to step out in obedience? It was really difficult um, because I think we got to the point where we knew that obedience was our only response and that had to be our next step. And so we had, at our, we had been deeply involved in a church plant. We had built deep community, deep roots there, great friendships. Um, we had really grown comfortable, surprisingly, and we had been there for five years, but um, we just, we had learned so much about discipleship and saying yes, and we knew that our next step had to be obedience, and that meant for us quitting our jobs, leaving everything we knew, going somewhere else where we didn't know anybody, um, really stepping into the unknown of what does this look like? We did not have all the answers, like Adam said, and so for us, the next step was obedience. Hmm. Okay, so that's kind of big picture, 30,000 foot view. Can you drill down a little bit? Give us a couple of examples of how you've seen this play out in the lives of college students as you've been discipling them and then hopefully they've been discipling others. Um, give us some examples of that. Yeah, it's, we could spend a lot of time here because yeah. after you take a step of faith, whether you want to or not, you begin to see and witness God's plan unfold. And if you don't see it after you take a true step of faith, you're not seeing it because he's yeah. doing it. He's working. And I mean, from the time that we moved, we, we knew, we felt like he, him say, you have a year to figure out like where you're going to live, but for a year, like you're good. And we lived rent free for a year and six months, I think, uh, just because of connect. We didn't know anybody when we moved there. We I accidentally met some guy on Facebook, but anyway, we we moved and God like really took care of us. That as sounds far as sketchy. You just met a guy on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, well, well, it's all right. He is a pastor. God works. Uh, Facebook. He was yeah. He's nice. Um, and so and they're still our friends now, which is great. But uh, just building, you know, starting over and building community is exhausting. But like God providing and putting the right people in place. But uh, now when you look at like ministry stuff and the things that, we, you know, we started this and then COVID hit. And so it was like, okay, what do we do? Well, we started doing Bible studies over Zoom, which I did not wanna do. And I thought there's no way that anybody's gonna care about this at all. And that became the catalyst of us starting small and building and building. And um, I mean, now it's, it's really crazy. And to look at what God has done. And when we have students that have, surrender their life to Jesus on our retreats, which these retreats are all about them coming. We train and teach them to go back to their college campus to go make disciples. So for the most part, the students interested in this are ones that are actively following Jesus. And we've had students surrender their life to Jesus. Um, we, this last retreat specifically, we had two students get baptized and we had nothing to do yeah. with it. But wow. the, the, the ones that baptized their friends are actively discipling their peers. And uh, this one specific kid, his name's Aaron, he's awesome, and he joined our guys Zoom study um, a few months ago, and we were in Daniel. <laughs> uh, it was like Daniel 9, which I don't know if, you, if anybody's doing a study in Daniel 9, it gets a little weird. Uh, and so we were working our way through Daniel 9 the best that we could, and it was after that night he asked his friend, he was like, hey, um, can you teach me how to pray? Wow. And his friend, who's one of our college students, and he's on our, our college student advisory team, 
he was like, yeah, I'd love to teach you how to pray. And so that just began this discipleship, you know, relationship. And fast forward to three weeks ago, they were driving down and he's fully given his life to Jesus through this whole discipleship act. Wow. And on the way down to the retreat, he was like, man, can you like explain to me what baptism is? And so the whole trip down to the beach, they talked about baptism and like why you do it. And he was like, I just, I wanna do that at the beach. And so they did, 45 degree, you know, temperature outside, they're getting baptized. So uh, it was just awesome. I mean, it was so cool. And yeah, and then I think there's a lot of stories. And I know there's, we're short for time, but there's some really cool stories from other retreats as well. Well, we, on Friday, or, you know, Saturday night at our retreat, we have a special dinner called The Table, and it's all about just gathering people mm. around the table and reminding them the importance of community and that there's a seat for you and that you belong, and just the power that you can have when you sit at a table and, and how that plays a role in discipleship. And we had two sisters, one retreat, and um, that they had never sat around the table before growing up, and they had been on our Zoom Bible studies from day one, but they're very quiet, introverted, and we just kind of thought, you know, that's just their personality. They don't, you know, it's kind of hard to go all out there on, on Zoom sometimes. And come to find out after the table, they, they pulled um, me and another leader away and um, just opened up for the first time in their whole life about this deep, dark brokenness that they had walked through and that they were still walking through. And they had just never been invited to the table. They had never been in other people's homes. Nobody... A meal wasn't ever prepared for them in their home to sit around a table, and um, how the Lord has just used that to soften their heart and to open it and to say, hey, even though you don't have this in your earthly family, like you have this in your heaven, you know, and through the Lord and through the, the family of God, and so um, that's just a little step in discipleship, and we're just encouraging them that, you know, that is discipleship. That is um, just sitting at the table with somebody is, is getting them closer yeah. to the Lord. And then one more. Yeah. Don't, don't cut me off yet. Well, this was, this was just cool because, <laughs> uh, just pat me on the shoulder, yeah, yeah. Um, that when, so talking about like just the Holy Spirit and like listening to the Spirit and um, I was sitting in a coffee shop before our, my office is basically a coffee shop. And so I was sitting there and, and working on some stuff for this retreat upcoming and I just felt this, like burden for these students that want to come, but gas prices were going through the roof, and we didn't have, we had 73 students on this last retreat, and not one of them drove under two hours to get there. So, so we had some drive like 10 and a half hours from Maryland and whatever, it's crazy. And so, which we're like, why, <laughs> what are you doing? I hope you like it. Um, and so they, um, so with all that, I just felt like, man, I really feel like we're gonna have students like either not sign up or just drop out because they can't afford yeah the gas prices, and so I started doing some math, and I was like, you know, our number is always around 50. We're not looking to, to blow this up and have thousands. We feel like for what we do and teach, the weekend is more catered towards 50 or so students, because that's kind of a good spot for us, and so we were like, okay, if there's this many, you know, how much would it cost for them to just have a free retreat, and then we were like, well, we don't want to do that, because then they'll really bail if they, didn't, if they didn't have any money in it, so we were like, well, what if they just had, like, a $50 gas gift card when they showed up. And so I started doing the math and I was like, okay, if we could just have $2,500, that would cover for this many to have a $50 gas gift card. So I told Caitlin, I was like, hey, here's the idea. And this is usually how it works. I'm like, hey, I heard from God, here's the idea, what do you think? She's like, nah, that's not gonna work. <laughs> and it's usually how it goes. So we, so we pray about it and whatever and God convicts her. Um, and so, <laughs> in, <laughs> So in that moment, I was like, hey, what if we did this, blah, 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 and she was like, yeah, that's awesome. How do you wanna do it? And I was like, I don't know. I guess we could just like put it out in our newsletter or whatever that we are looking for $2,500 donation for this reason. And no joke, next morning in our PO box, two checks for $2,500. I didn't even, I didn't have time to like announce it. Like it was just, and that, and again, like this is not like a money pitch or anything like that. Um, there's no way for you to like give towards us in the back. This is not what this is for. This is for the fact that when you take steps of faith and that's what you're living on, you see God do amazing things in and around you and be looking. Like be, that for us, we're still looking yeah. and wanting to see that. And that, when we say like living in the middle of what God's calling you to do, it's, it's that kind of stuff, yeah. you know? And yeah. it's documenting it so that you never forget it because mm. it's just really cool so stuff. Good. Hey, I just wanna pray over you guys before you uh, take off. Can we pray over them? If you wanna just extend your hand toward them, feel free to do that. Lord, we just thank you for Adam and Caitlin and Refuge Retreat, their family. Lord, how you're using them. Uh, we are just so grateful to be a small part of their lives. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue to bless them. And may they see 
um, multiplication and kingdom fruit for what they are doing and as they step out in obedience. Uh, Lord, they are common everyday people like every one of us in this room or watching online and yet they have just chosen to say yes, uh, attentive to your spirit and then responsive. And so I just pray that you would encourage them and bless them today in Jesus' name, amen. Will you uh, thank Adam and Caitlin for being here? Thanks, Lord. They, um, they're gonna be, they've got a table in the lobby. They would love to meet you. They would love to answer any questions that you have and just share more stories with you. Um, church, can we, can we be people who are attentive to the spirit and then just simply responsive, to just say yes? Can we be that, that kind of church, those kind of people? Here, here's what I, I wanna challenge you. Our team put together just a simple graphic it's a wallpaper that you can put on your phone, your digital device. Um, you can download it uh, from our website or the QR code. Uh, it'll be on our social media as well. I just wanna encourage you, set that as your lock screen and your home screen. And, and I would encourage you to leave it on there for the next month. And every time you look at it, it's just gonna say those two questions. God, what are you saying and doing? And what do you want me to do about it? And then I... Listen, I double dog dare you, okay? Anybody remember that phrase? I double dog dare you to come back to me in a month and tell me that God didn't answer that. Because he will. The question is, will you say yes?